Okay, this is a continuation of a verse-by-verse -verse study through the Epistle of Paul, the Apostle, to the Hebrews. To the Hebrews, because that's what the title of the letter is, Hebrews. Uh, we're up to chapter 4, verse 12, with new territory. But uh, beginning in, in chapter 3, all the way through here, he's giving a fair warning to the doctrinal position of, of the Hebrews during the Great Tribulation, uh, encouraging them, exhorting them, warning them to not fall at, after the same example of unbelief, the example of the Old Testament history of Israel. So historically, yes, uh, the Hebrews uh, in the day that Paul wrote this uh, could get some uh, spiritual application out of this, as you and I can do the same. And here in verse 12, we most certainly can get some spiritual application out of this universal truth. But in the immediate doctrinal fulfillment here, as he's directed this, addressed this to the Hebrews over here, in the last days, that's back in chapter 1, verse 2, he's exhorting them not to fall away uh, through unbelief, and then he provides here in 12 through the rest what is available for them to receive strength to not fall away. Here is the word of God. The word of lowercase w right there, lowercase w. So that's paper and ink, word of God. And then down here is flesh and bones, word of God. Here, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So they have the paper and ink, word of God, which will quicken them and empower them. And then they have the flesh and bones word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will uh, provide them the grace and mercy that they need to help, to help in the time of need. And this flesh and bones word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, would be their high priest. Again, there, there another evidence. Uh, he's dealing with Hebrews. Okay, so that's the uh, uh, deer here. Uh, so 4 verse 12 is, is, is a universal promise for uh, anyone reading the Bible. So that's the lowercase w, word of God. And let's go take a look at that word of God over here. And what do we find? Okay, so we have the word of God. And it's found 49 times, 49, hmm, 7 times 7, 49 times, word of God, lowercase w, uh, 1 Samuel 9, 27, first occurrence in the Bible, and he's uh, referring to Samuel. And then here, it, it, we are told that every word of God is pure, okay, every word of God is pure. And here, Jesus said that the Pharisees of his day made the word of God of none effect through their tradition. And then Jesus reveals here how vital the word of God is uh, to the every individual. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Okay, the New Bibles usually put a period right here at this comma and then drop these six words. So I tell you those things so that I can show you the true from the air, from the clean and the unclean. I do believe that is the part of the uh, duty and responsibility of uh, someone teaching the Word of God. And here... 2 Corinthians 2.17, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. All the new Bibles take this out, put a pedal 
or its derivative in the replacement. So this is changed by all of them, New King Jimmy and everything. But as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. So we are not to handle the word of God deceitfully, not to handle it deceitful. We are to use it to uh, make a commendation to the conscience. And here we're going to see that word of God is equivalent or um, compared to a sword. You take the S off, you got word. So it's compared to a sword. And then right here, this verse reveals why um, people who use the King James uh, Bible, but they don't believe it, uh, do not get uh, many uh, ideas out of the Word of God, and they basically are limited to what they would call the fundamentals. Okay, so this reads, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as a word of men. So right there, if a man is a King James uh, teacher or preacher, he says he uses the King James, he might even say King James only. Well, if, if he believes that a translation is the work of men, and not the work of God or the word of God, here's, here's the trouble. But as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You see, you believe that this book, the King James Bible, is the word of God, not just a mere translation of men. When you believe it, then it works effectually. It's effective in your life. And then here in 412 is where we're at in this new territory. So let's take a look at that. So he says the word of God. So this is the subject of the sentence. This is a prepositional phrase. You remember those days of word of God is, there's the uh, a verb, is quick. It is quick. What, well, what in that mean? It is quick. I mean, is it fast? Is it run fast? Is that what it is? Well, let's see how the Bible defines its words. So we look up the word quick. We don't. I don't look it up in a Hebrew or Greek dictionary. I don't look it up in a lexicon or a leprechaun, anything like that. I I read English. So I'm going to look for it in English. Now, these first few occurrences, you know, you can't really get much out of that, trying to figure it out. What does quick mean? But when you get down in here, here's the Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is quick and powerful. Okay, here we have Acts 10.42, the judge of the quick and the dead. Oh, well, I, if I don't know what this says, I do know what this is, and these are obviously opposites. So the judge of the what? Uh, living in the dead? But why did he say quick? Uh, because that's the word God wanted. Second Timothy 4 1. The quick and the dead. Again, the opposite of dead. Who shall give an account to himself that is ready to judge the quick living and the dead. So let's add quicken to here and let's see what the word the paper and ink word of God can do for uh, doctrinally for the Hebrews of the tribulation and it can do for you and me today in these days Psalm 119 the largest psalm uh, in the Bible and it has several of these quicken to be made alive how are we made alive? Quicken thou me according to thy word, lowercase w, according to. So the word of God can give us life if you believe it. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Quicken me after thy loving kindness. 
Okay, quicken me, O Lord, according to thy word. So we got it again, that word of God. So the more time you spend in the word of God, the more you receive life. Yes, physical life. Not just, not just spiritual life. It's also improving your physical, mental health. Okay? Quicken me according to thy word. Quicken me according to thy judgment. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness. Oh, man, that's all, all through there, isn't there? And we get that from the uh, written word of God. Let's, I want to show you Proverbs chapter 3 to give you a little more evidence of this about the written word of God where it not only helps you men spiritually, it helps you mentally. It helps your mental outlook on life. And it increases your physical uh, living in life. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For the length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. You know, I'm a, I'm a health nutty guy. And it's a, it's a shame that the health nutty people are usually in the new agey realm. And they are forfeiting uh, the extra life that they need, the quality of life, when they don't read the Bible. Here, still the same idea, length of days is there in her right hand, and her left hand, riches and her honor. So here I've extended the word quickeneth, up to quickeneth. I've, I've extended the word to quickeneth. So the derivative of quick or quicken. And here we find that G, this is in the controversial chapter of John chapter 6. And Jesus says, It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. Okay, so if what I've given you is correct as far as the usage of this word, meaning the opposite of dead or to be made alive, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words lowercase w, that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are, oh, there we go, they are life. Wow, isn't that, isn't that a great thought? Okay, and then we have quickened here, and you have several places, the, for thy word hath quickened me, for with them thou, uh, Thou hast quickened me, where he didn't forget thy precepts. Man, it's all in there. Man, it's just fascinating. And then you hath he quickened, that, that, who were dead, he did. So the opposite, you were made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. You know, that's a kind of a Calvinist uh, springboard uh, where they jump in uh, the muddy part of the, of the pond. Okay, so that's when we uh, use the words in the English Bible for the Word of God is quick. It's, it's alive. It gives life, is what it does, and powerful. Okay, this verse says, you know, where the word of a king is, there is power. And so, yeah, oh man, most certainly true. What proves the Word of God is powerful. The evidence that you want to see how powerful this book is, is how it influences uh, the speech of people. Many common sayings come from this book. Like, here's one, the judge threw the book at him. Okay, there you go. And that's where this is coming from, because it's powerful. And then uh, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And the word sword, if you, you take that little S off, you got the word there. So the word of God is sharper than the great cross references there. You got several of these. So here we have uh, the two-edged sword, okay, in their hand. So Psalm 149, and it says, let the high praises of God be in their mouth and the two-edged sword in their hand. So this shows that the sword or the word can be in your hand. And that is that does not refer to the originals. It doesn't refer to the original manuscripts at all. And so then we have the Hebrews 4.12 there. And then we have here, uh, this is uh, the Lord Jesus, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. So he's quoting scripture. He's quoting scripture to uh, to, and that is powerful, sharpening a two-edged sword. Now, if um, 
what's the usual thing if you hand a little boy a pocket knife or something? You hand him a pocket knife, and what do you say? You say, uh, don't cut yourself. You know, like, like, you know, like he, 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 probably the first thing, oh, really? I didn't know that. I think I'm, oh, hey, I come with you. Uh, no, but you do have to handle a knife or a sword very carefully so you don't cut yourself. And so when you have the word of God, uh, you and I need to handle it very carefully. So what does the word of God do? piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. So notice this word of God is a divider. It divides uh, your soul and spirit from your body. And that's, that's known in the New Testament as spiritual circumcision. But even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, Okay, and is what is, and is. So this is a compound sentence. So the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So uh, what does that mean? Uh, well, actually, that means that the written word of God discerns and criticizes the evil motives of the heart of man. In other words, as a person happens to read the Bible, the Bible is reading their thoughts and intents. That's the flat, that's the paper and ink word of God. It, you, you have a sneaky suspicion as I'm looking at these words that these words are looking back at me, but they're looking back in my heart. And this, my friend, is pr the primary reason why people resist looking at the Bible, or they fear looking at the Bible, or they say, I can't see it, I can't see it. It's because the written word of God is a discerner. It discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, this is the written word of God. This is the flesh and bones word of God. That's an uppercase W there. You find that in Revelation 19, 13. This is the written word of God. Where and Then it says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. So here he puts the male pronoun to the word of God. In Proverbs 8, I think it's used as a female pronoun. Her, okay, but here it's his, but all things are naked and opened under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So this written word of God is a discerner of our thoughts and intents, our intentions, and man, we're just naked in front of it and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So that that's this, this written word. Uh, paper and ink that I'm reading. So this word of God is gives life. It's got power. The power of this book, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And so yes, man, that that is what will give life to you today, to me, if we. Use it properly. We are careful how we handle it, like it says in 2 Corinthians 4. And then we recognize, oh, we got to rightly divide the word of truth. There's proper divisions. So for the Hebrew uh, of the last days, uh, he will have the word of God to empower him to overcome the sin of unbelief. And he can be an overcomer that uh, Revelation 2 and 3 talk about. And then we have the flesh and bones word of God, seeing then that we, we Hebrews, have a great high priest. Oh man, they know what that is. Now back here in chapter 3, verse 1, he is referring to, uh, he introduced here and compared him to Moses. So here, the high priest, Christ Jesus, and then he compared him to Moses. 
And so here we have it again. So they have a high priest that understands the suffering that they're going through. Now, at this moment, that is passed into the heavens. So bodily resurrection. Thus, Jesus, Jesus, yeah, just like up there in 4 verse 8, the Son of God. Yes, God has a Son. Allah doesn't, but God has a Son. And because of the paper and ink word of God here, and the flesh and bones word of God here, that will empower them and give them life, let us hold fast our profession. See, that's, that's the immediate, in the doctrinal immediate context of the Hebrew of the tribulation is that they can overcome the sin of unbelief through the written word of God and the flesh and bones word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if we go back here and type in the word word and we have case sensitive, so it's an uppercase W. So we see it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, isn't that something? Isn't that an amazing thing? I mean, the word of God is 49 occurrences, and uppercase word, in the beginning was the word, word was with God, and the word was God. These are all used by John the Apostle, every one of these. Okay, and the word was made flesh. Is that That's a no-brainer, isn't it? A word was made flesh. And then he says, the word of life. Matching Hebrews 4, where the word of God is quick. It's quick. It gives life. It gives life. And then here, this, oh man, this verse is a hotbed. This is a battlefield among the scholars. They try to, man, they try to hot potato this verse, try to get rid of it. The new Bibles, here's what the new Bibles have, for there are three that bear record in heaven, period, period. They put a period right there, and they drop all of this. <laughs> Why do they do that? Great verse in the Godhead. Holy Ghost. The Father. The Word. Oh, I kind of see why they drop it. It is comparing the paper and ink Word of God to the flesh and bones Word of God. Sometimes so hard uh, you can't tell them apart. And these three are one. Now if we hit that, these three are one. And then the parallel here, these three agree in one. And then the seventh occurrence with the case-sensitive word of God, it's a no-brainer. He was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. Now, that's obviously the Lord Jesus Christ. So, in this uh, context of Hebrews 4, this is paper and ink word of God. And this is flesh and bones, word of God. And here, he's the high priest of Israel. But he's, he's the high priest, but he knows and feels and empathizes and he grieves for their suffering of the tribulation. And he says here, for we, we, the Hebrews have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. So, meaning the high priest can, this high priest can be touched with the feeling of their infirmities. We have not a high priest, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin, the sinless Savior. How do you know that? Well, the resurrection. The resurrection proves the sinless Savior because you can't keep a good man down. And then Jesus said, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one. That's God. And so here's, uh, here's the access to the flesh and bones word of God. Here, let us, the Hebrews. Now this... This, this, even though he's addressing this to Hebrews, my friend, this is universal. This is universal. When he talks about the high priest here, okay, that's Jewish. Okay, but let us come boldly under the throne of grace. Now, the funny 
clowns on TV, they say you come boldly, you know, and get your you get your uh, fancy car, you know, your airplanes and stuff like that. No, no, you no, you come boldly for what? To get grace. You get boldly, you come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in a time of need. Now, mercy and grace, they, they're kind of um, complement each other. Mercy would be the negative side. Grace would be the positive side. Mercy would be uh, not receiving something you deserve. Grace is receiving something you don't deserve. Mercy, I'm not going to hell. No matter how much people say, go to hell, man, go to hell. Oh, sorry, can't. Because I have God's mercy. Grace. I'm going to heaven. I'm going into the presence of Jesus Christ. Going into the kingdom of God. Man, I don't deserve it. I deserve hell. And I don't deserve heaven. But because of the mercy of Jesus Christ and his grace, I am going to heaven. Now, in this context, the grace here is not a salvation by grace. This is a dispensing of grace to help in the time of need. Okay, so this is a this is a a, a living grace. Okay, and so here, this is why I use Romans twelve, uh, verse three. So in Romans twelve, you can see this is a living sacrifice. Okay, we're not to conform to this world. And then how, how are we going to have the power to, you know, by the mercy of God, how are we going to have power to live acceptably unto God? Do not conform to this world. Be transformed. How is that going to take place? Through the grace given unto me. To every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God to, hath dealt to every man the measure of grace. Okay, so this is grace given unto me. One way to increase that grace is found in 2 Corinthians 9, where he says this, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly sh shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap awful bountifully. If every man according as his purpose is art, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God love the cheerful giver. Okay, at this point, a person is going to, oh, roll their eye, and then, oh, you know, I'm begging for money, oh, I'm begging for money. No, not going to do that. Okay, uh, you give according to your heart uh, wherever you want to. But when you do, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound every good work. And then the sentence is down here being enriched in everything with to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. A simple practical definition of this daily grace is, is uh, God giving you the ability to put up with anything or anyone with peace in your heart and have thanksgiving. Now this is given, this is awarded in uh, Ephesians chapter 4. He shows that this is available but unto every one of us is given, is given. That's just like 2 Corinthians or 2 Timothy, just like 2 Timothy 3.16. Watch, watch this, man. Watch this. Is given. And we can run it down through here. Okay, and so here's, we all come all the way down to the second to the last one. And it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And then the scholars will tell you, oh, the beloved original manuscripts. But that should be was given. Uh, this is present tense. Is uh, given. So what is given present tense now today? Uh, this one here. But unto every one of us is given grace. Is that today? Yeah, yeah, that sure is. Here uh, is sp our spiritual gifts, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given. Yeah, and everyone is given. Well, man, that's all that's present tense. Wah, mama mia, papa pia. Okay, and here, 1 Corinthians 3.10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me. Okay, and here for the grace of God, which is given you by Christ Jesus. 
and the grace that is given to me of God. This is all present tense. And here in Romans 12, where it says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us, and then the Holy Ghost, which is given unto Those are all present tense. And hence, the inspiration of God is given. That means it's present tense. So this Hebrews 4, 16, when he's talking about this, you see, we need this grace to live a victorious life for the Lord. And since he's given us the word of God, okay, the paper and ink word of God, which will help us to live a victorious life, and then he give the Lord Jesus is the flesh and uh, bones word of God, which is also given so we can live a victorious life and be an overcomer. Here, we're asking for the trifecta, where we need the grace of God to believe the Word of God and the Son of God. And so the Lord wants us to be more than conquerors, the New Testament believer, Romans 8, be more than a conqueror, universal. In order to do that, we need grace and mercy and we need to find that grace from the throne of grace. Now this find grace, find grace, uh, that, that I do believe is the only occurrence in the New Testament for find grace, but there's a bunch of them in the Old Testament. See, look at all these in the Old Testament. Ten occurrences, all in the Old Testament here, except for Hebrews. With that knowledge, this shows us that Hebrews is connected to the Old Testament. That's why Hebrews picks up the Daniel's 70th week, okay, and it's all about Israel. So you have found Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord 18 times, 18 times. All of these are in the Old Testament, all of them. So find grace 10 times, found grace 18 times, find grace once in the New Testament, and guess where we find it? In the epistle to the Hebrews. That's why Hebrews is still picking up some unfinished business between God and Israel, okay, in the, even though it's in the New Testament. It's the unfinished business is Daniel's 70, 70th week. So this, this universal promise here, where all of us, we, we need grace for today. And so this is universal. This high priest, okay, that goes Jewish, and this is part of rightly dividing word of truth. So you say, I don't understand that grace. You don't have to understand it. Just go to the throne of grace to God, beg for his mercy, and beg for his grace, and see what he does.